the integral converges at infinity, and since uh, zeta hat of zero is zero and zeta is smooth, then at least zeta hat grows at worst linearly when, in, when t is less than one, okay? And so that kills this singularity and, it, and the, this integral converges. And then it's just a matter of renormalizing to make the, the integral equal one, okay? All right. So then, in that case, this operator QT that we define to be convolution with, with zeta t, um, then QT satisfies the so-called Calderon reproducing formula, which is that the integral from zero to infinity of QT squared dt over t is the identity operator in what sense? In the strong operator topology, on the space of bounded operators on L2. I'll explain what that means when we prove this. So this thing is called the, the Calderon reproducing formula, right? It's, it's, it's a resolution of the identity, right? Okay. So here's the proof, it's gonna be very easy. Um, so what we're saying here, what we need to show, in other words, is that for F in L2, that integral from, let's say, epsilon to one over epsilon of QT squared F dt over T converges to F in L2 as epsilon goes to zero. All right. So this is an easy exercise in Planck-Schorell's theorem. Or in the use of Planck-Schorell's theorem. Okay, so. Planck-Schorell, we have the following. Take the L2 norm of the difference Planck-Sorel's theorem tells us that the L2 norm of this expression is the same as the L2 norm of its Fourier transform. So this is the same as integral from epsilon to one over epsilon. When we take the Fourier transform, the Fourier transform turns convolutions into multiplications. And the thing we're multiplying by is the Fourier transform of zeta t, which becomes, I'm gonna use that sort of sloppy notation, but I think you know what I mean. It's gonna be zeta hat of t times c, and I'm gonna abuse notation since this is radial and write the modulus of c. Since there are two of them, this gets squared. Since zeta was real and radial, so is, so is zeta hat. Um, then we have dt over t minus one times f hat in L2. Okay, all right, but now you just here make the change of variable. T goes to T divided by mod C, and then let epsilon go to zero and use dominated convergence along with this fact. Okay, and then you're done. Okay. All right. So now, associated to such a QT operator, we're gonna define the vertical square function
which is also known as sometimes Littlewood-Paley G function. Wow, the original Littlewood-Paley G function was for a very particular QT, one based on derivatives of the Poisson extension, but this is sort of a generalization of that. Okay, and it's defined as follows. G of F of X, which for a given zeta, maybe I'll write it as G zeta of F at X. This is gonna be the L2 norm on the half line of QT F of X squared dt over t. Okay, where qt, again, is say the t star f. Okay, so. The next fact is the following. Um, for zeta as above. And in fact, we can even weaken this to, to simply insisting that zeta hat of C, well, it doesn't even really need to be radial for this part. Zeta hat of C is less than or equal to the minimum, well, up to a constant, the minimum of C to the alpha C to the minus alpha for some alpha positive. Okay, because if C hat has, satisfies these bounds, then the analog of this integral is gonna converge, okay? All right. So in other words, um, integral zero to infinity, of zeta hat of t c squared dt over t, um, which, okay, this is gonna be less than or equal to, say, some uh, some bound mu of zeta uniformly in c, okay? So then what we're gonna say is that um, uh, the conclusion is that maybe let me do it like this. That the L2 norm of G zeta is less than or equal to mu of zeta times the L2 norm of F. And I'm gonna omit the, omit the proof It's actually in the notes, but this is again just an exercise in Plancharel's theorem. Okay, let me use this fact. What is, is that zeta? Is that a constant? Or? Mu of zeta is a constant, yeah. The, we're saying that uniformly in C. This is easiest to see if, if this guy is radial, because if this guy is radial, then you make the change of variable, T goes to T divided by length of C and this isn't even there, and so it really is a constant. But otherwise, with these bounds, it's gonna be bounded by a constant, okay? A uniform constant, depending on alpha, okay? Okay, all right, so of course I told you I was gonna deal with non-convolution operators and the only thing we've done so far is to talk about convolution ones, but here's where we want to make a generalization, all right? So we're gonna define the notion of a Littlewood-Paley kernel L, L dash P stands for Littlewood-Paley. Okay, 
So we're going to be talking about a family of operators, or family of kernels, psi t of x, y, indexed by some positive parameter t. Psi t is going to map rn cross rn into the complex numbers. And we're going to assume that we have the following two conditions. There's a, a Littlewood-Paley size condition, which is that, okay. So we're going to assume that there exists some positive alpha and some finite constant c such that we have this. The size condition is that We have this upper bound for the modulus of psi t. And we're going to have a smoothest condition which is that it, which is basically a lo local Helder continuity condition in the y variable only. And you might wonder about the x variable. For L2 theory, we don't need it in the x variable. We just need it in the y variable. Uh, to do LP theory, you want it in the, at least for P less than one, uh, sorry, for P bigger than one, P, for P bigger than two, I should say. For P bigger than two, you want smoothness in the X variable as well, but we're not going to worry about that, okay? So the bound should be C times length of H to the alpha over T plus X minus Y to the N plus alpha. And this is to hold provided that length of h is less than or equal to t. Okay. So a kernel with those bounds satisfies the Littlewood-Paley size and smoothness condition, or generally the Littlewood-Paley kernel condition. Um, so of course, these nice zeta t's that were C0 infinity and compactly supported satisfy this property, but um, other things do as well. For example, if you take T times a derivative of the classical Poisson kernel, going to satisfy those conditions. Actually, the Poisson kernel itself does, but in a moment, we're going to want some kind of cancellation condition, which does not apply to the Poisson kernel, but does apply to its derivatives. This is Poisson kernel in the half space, I should say. Yes? I can actually see it below from over here. What's the symbol you're using for the kernel? Psi. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, I, I think my handwriting is starting to, to shrink as I go along. So if, I, if it starts getting too small, you can't read it, please let me know. Okay. All right. And now associated to these guys, we're going to define an operator, theta t f of x is going to be defined to be integral in Rn against the kernel psi t. And I apologize for this because as I, when I start writing rapidly, my, my thetas and my q's start to morph into each other. I will try to reserve the qt for the convolution guys and theta for the non-convolution. Hopefully, you'll be able to read the difference. Um, okay, but in fact, that's not a complete coincidence. The theta t's are going to be generalizations to the non-convolution setting of, the, of these QTs, okay? All right, so just a remark. Note that soup over T bigger than zero of theta TF is controlled point-wise by the Hardy littlewood maxwell function of F. And that's just because this kernel, the size condition of the kernel, 
it's controlled by something that's a rescaling of a radial decreasing L1 kernel, okay? So this lemma 2.1 applies here, for example, okay? So in particular, we have uniform L2 bounds, uniform in T for the theta Ts. The operator norm, and for me, operator norm means L2 to L2 operator norm. The operator norm of theta t is bounded by some uniform constant uniformly in t. Okay? All right. So let's see, can I do this in five minutes? All right. So. We're going to assume that we have a family of operators that belong to this Lewin Paley class. Theta t is going to be defined this way. And we're going to assume further that theta t of 1 is identically 0, which means, in other words, that if you integrate this expression with f set equal to 1, this is going to equal 0 for all x and rn. Okay? All right. Then in that case, the little and painly g function associated to theta, and I'll write it out explicitly in a moment, is bounded on L2. Okay? So g theta just means, well, it's this thing, but with qt replaced by theta t. And of course, with the constants in the L2 bound, depending only on dimension and these little wood paley kernel conditions. So the proof, well, I'll do at least part of the proof here, okay? So I'm going to set, for future reference, some expression I'll call i. Well, to be the, L, the square of the L2 norm of g theta of f. And the square of the L2 norm of g theta of f if you think about it, you're integrating an Rn and squaring that thing. That's this guy. Okay. Ah, these should be inverted the way I wrote this, but you know what I mean. At this point, we're going to use this Calderon reproducing formula, okay? So let zeta be C0 infinity, or the unit ball, radial, integral of zeta equals zero, and satisfying the Calderon reproducing formula, which we can always do if this is non-trivial after normalization. Okay, so then this is the same as integral zero to infinity, integral on Rn. I expand f as the integral of qs squared f integrated from zero to infinity, ds over s. And the integral interchanges with this L2 bounded operator. 
It interchanges with L2 bounded operators because this convergence is in the strong operator topology on B of L2. Okay? So this is integral from zero to infinity of theta t of qs squared of f ds over s squared dx dt over t. Okay? And now I'm going to multiply and divide by a certain factor and then use Cauchy Schwartz in the S integration. All right? So this is less than or equal to integral 0 to infinity, integral on Rn. I have an integral from 0 to infinity of the minimum of S over T, T over S to some positive power beta to be chosen in a moment. All right? DS over S. And then I have, similarly, well, the reciprocal of this will give me the maximum of those guys. And then I'll have this expression squared. And then I have here ds over s and then dx dt over t. Okay, well notice that this is just some constant that depends on beta, right? That's integrable with bound independent of t, right? Just make a change of variable, okay? And so what things boil down to is the following fact. is sometimes called quasi-orthogonality, which is that the operator norm here is, that is the L2 to L2 operator norm of theta t composed with qs is less than or equal to a constant times the minimum of s over t, t over s to the power beta. What I should say is that there exists a beta positive such that this is true. Okay, so I'm running out of time. I basically have run out of time. So I won't have time to prove that. I'll leave it to you to look in the notes and see how it's done. Uh, there's also an exercise associated to this. Um, but once you have that, then notice that if I integrate an Rn here first using Fubini, I pick up the square of the operator norm there, which gives me this factor, but with the minimum and with power 2 beta. And that beats the maximum, and then this just converges. Okay? And then the result follows. All right? And since I'm out of time, I won't write down the details, but again, it's in the notes. Okay? All right? So I'm at the limit of the time, so let me stop. Thanks for your attention this morning. Are there any questions? Okay. <laughs> you can save your questions for, for Zihui. All right, thank you.